there. Boom. Here we go. Awesome. Alrighty, so today's topic is very, very simple. And the reason I uh, chose this topic today is because I think a lot of you need a damn refresher, especially if you're just moving into solar or maybe you've been in solar for a while, but you're not quite getting the type of customer engagement that you'd like. This is one of the number one problems that I see. I, it's a very much a mindset issue. It's a it's a it's much of a, of a deeper mindset issue that many think. In fact, I'm going to start going over stuff today, and a lot of people watching live or the replay are going to say like, "Oh no, I I've already heard this. I get this." But at the same time, you don't implement it. It's very surface level level for a lot of people. When you ask, you know, why do people go solar? They'll list a bunch of like very shallow shallow things. I want to challenge your mindset. I want to wrap up at the end of this with a real real challenging statement. Um, that I hope to rub a lot of people the wrong way and get you thinking about what solar sales is all about. All right, that's the goal. We'll see if we can achieve that. So today, why people really go solar? Let's dive into this interesting topic. So here's the itinerary I got for us. Number one, uh, understanding what I call placeholder products. Um, so we'll take a look at what that is. Um, also, I'm going to dive into what role you as a salesperson, we might have some people involved in install or financing or whatever, but for those of you installed in sales, uh, uh, involved in sales right now, watching this live, watching the replay, I want to cover what your role is and I want to challenge you on maybe what you think your role is versus what it is or what it should be, especially when it comes to customer interaction. Thirdly, we're going to... Uh, cover uh, what things customers do not care about 99.9% .9 of the time uh, what a lot of people what have you guys put uh, attention into what a lot of uh, energy that you put into certain things that customers just truly do not give a rat's ass about we're going to cover a few of those uh, then we're going to cover it what customers actually care about what you should be focusing on what you should be uh, not wasting your time with the other stuff and putting all of your attention onto what they actually care about on a fundamental level when it comes to going solar and then lastly like I said I'm gonna uh, throw in a few mindset challenges and mindset changes wrap it up with five uh, and the last uh, comment that I'm gonna make the very last one I do hope it's really gonna rub people the wrong way or at least get you thinking uh, about maybe you should change your approach when it comes to solar sales virtual or in-home I don't care all right but that's the goal for today so Let's jump into it. Number one, let's talk about placeholder products. What do I mean about placeholder products? Uh, I've made some very intricate, uh, you know, if it's too detailed for you, uh, don't worry. Uh, I know I, I make some very intricate diagrams at times, but bear with me and try to follow along, shall we? So if you have to zoom in on the screen here, feel free. The first thing is I want to cover why people want money. Let's start with money. I got three things here. The technical term, I believe it's a Venn diagram. Uh, I learned that in high school. Never used it again until today. We got three options here. Why do people want money? Um, we got the the small red one there. Is there a currency collector, right? So you know, want money because they, they, they love collecting currencies, right? You ever go to those bars and they just have dollar bills from every country um, uh, of the patrons. And they just keep giving dollar bills and they pass it on the back. They're currency. That's what they want money. Surely, yeah, right. Obviously. A third, another one is um, that they need to build a campfire. Right, that's why they want the money because they 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 got nothing else and they need a little kindling, a little paper to start the fire. No, those two are ridiculous. They want money because they want freedom. They don't care about the the paper. They don't want to make a fire. They don't care about the practical value of the thing that they're holding. What does money mean for them? It's freedom, of course. Everyone knows that, right? There's a very small amount of people that that want to make a campfire or currency collectors. A vast majority of people care about the placeholder value of money of a of a twenty dollar bill what can that do for me this this bill you know I, I don't know I should have actually probably done my research and and figured out how much money it actually cost to to generate the material of like a twenty dollar bill probably a few cents I'm guessing someone make a Google search right now and put it in the comments they don't care about that what they care about is what money can do for them ie the freedom that it gives them let's move on Hopefully I really hammer home my point at the beginning of this. You guys get the theme of this uh, webinar. Why do people want to buy Lamborghinis? Well, they could be a car collector. Sure, I, I want all the Lamborghinis. I want to put it in my, uh, my garage of 50 supercars. Um, or maybe they just really love the pristine manufacturing of Lamborghinis and exactly how it drives. Oh, no. 
a vast majority of people that want Lamborghinis because they saw it on Instagram and they want the status. I actually Lamborghini is actually not the uh, from my understanding. I'm not a car guy, but I don't think Lamborghinis are the nicest uh, uh, cars in terms of driving. Um, in fact, when it comes to status, the uh, high level, the the supercar manufacturers know this so much that many Bugatti, uh, McLaren, all these super high end cars, they do not let anyone just buy the cars. Right? You have to almost go in for an interview. There's a wait list. You will get rejected. Now, is it because there's a supply issue? No. It's because they know that the benefit behind their product isn't because it's just car collectors or their car just drives really nicely. It's because it's a status symbol. And if they let all the anyone that, that had the money to buy a car driving around in their car, that status symbol might go away. Why? Because then people would see these uh, other people that don't look that fancy or uh, in, in one of their cars, and then the status of that car, the environment of that might start going down, and then that which really sells the car becomes nothing. And now it just becomes a, an expensive car that drives a bit faster than all the others. The key benefit of why people want to buy uh, Lamborghinis uh, is because of that status symbol. What, you, you're gonna drive uh, 200 miles an hour on the way to work and back? No, what's the difference between a Toyota Corolla and that? Toyota Corolla never dies. I've had like three or four, they last. You want a car that gets you from A to B, the practical value, get a Toyota Corolla. You don't get a Lamborghini or a supercar for the practical value, you get it for a status symbol, okay? Let's move on, you're starting to see a theme of placeholder value and placeholder product. Why do people get haircuts? Well, there are certain people, maybe, I don't know, maybe they want a little rain protection. You know, the, the, their hair was flat. They needed it more up because, you know, in the thunderstorms, they don't like, you know, water getting into their brows. So they need to spike their hair for it. Maybe, maybe. And maybe also they need a little protection, right? Maybe, again, their hair was getting really thin. They wanted to make it more voluminous. So in case one day they, you know, hit the, the concrete, they just want to bounce off it a bit. Who knows? Maybe UFC fighters, they put their hair in a certain way. I know the, the women UFC fighters, they'll braid the hair. Um, so uh, they have a bit of a practical value. So it's not all over the place. But the primary reason for getting a nice haircut is to look and feel nice for yourself and for others. There is a placeholder value for doing an action. You're starting to get the theme now. So when it comes to what I got, one more, one solar. Here's the issue that a lot of people, that, yeah, they see this on the surface level, but they won't implement it on a deeper level. They see solar and they'll start pitching solar. So the two I have here, and there's many, maybe there's some people that want solar because they want to save the planet. Now, been in solar for 10 years. I don't, I don't even know how many deals I or my team have closed at this point. Well, four or five figures, I can't remember. I don't have all the spreadsheets from 10 years ago to add all up, but I damn well know that I have uh, two sales ever were from people that didn't care about the money, didn't care about anything except saving the planet. Two that I remember, and maybe there's one or two more. Thousands, thousands, thousands of installs and sales. Two, two. The other one I have here is they just like solar panels. They just like the tech. It's interesting technology, I, you know, no. But that one, that blue one, just liking the tech, the solar, is what I see so many people replacing with the orange one. I'll get into what that means in a bit, but clearly people, a vast majority of people are not going solar because they want to save the planet. I'm sorry if that, that crushes your dreams that people are just going solar in droves because they really want to have a positive impact on the environment. I'm sorry to say it is completely untrue. And secondly, People are not going in droves because they like the tech, they like panels, they like the details of the panels and the technology and the equipment. They're going because it potentially, maybe, gives them a bit of freedom in their life. That is the core, and, and we can expand, and we will expand on what that freedom could look like to certain customers, but that is the core of solar sales. So, I've set the tone here. Let's dive into a bit more info and some examples. Because again, I know a lot of you watching this right now, okay, that's basic. I hear it all the time. Oh, Josh, I already know this stuff. It's basic, it's basic. And they come in, I listen to call examples or call recordings or I look at their numbers and they're trash. Surface level, implementation, different. Let's take a look at some place all, all the products. So there's two, two types of mindsets when it comes to solar sales. I've seen it all, I've done it all. 
One, amateur solar salespeople will, and I'll jump into a bit more into this in a sec, but they will assume their customers uh, uh, see intrinsic value in solar. What do I mean by that? I mean that when they see their customer hear solar, see solar, they assume that their customer understands what solar can do for them. And so they start at that point. They start as if someone has already gone in and explained the benefits. And that, that uh, uh, shows in many, many ways. Um, the one I have at the bottom of the amateur solar sales people, this is very, very common. People will go straight in with the, you know, are you sure you don't want solar? It's no out-of-pocket cost. I, I, you know, I don't want to take any extra cash from you. Why would they care if something is no out-of-pocket cost if they don't see any benefit in it? Very, very super, super common thing I see. Guys running ads, cold callers, uh, inbound leads, they'll heavily, heavily push on that before ever expanding into what solar actually is or what it's gonna do for their customers. Um, often a super common one, like this is probably 80, 90% of solar sales guys out there, focusing on the equipment, how amazing their equipment is, their brands, the install, the financing terms, and how they have the best financing or the technology behind their install, just heavy focusing on that, just amateur hour, absolute amateur hour, what elite solar salespeople are doing, well, number one is assuming their customers have absolutely no idea how solar works, what it does, how it benefits them at all. They start from the basics and they build the infrastructure uh, from day one when they interact with the customer. They focus on what X, and I'm gonna be using this type of terminology uh, a, a bit throughout today's uh, webinar, what X, in this case solar, does as a whole not just as singular components, as a whole for their customers. And what I mean by as a whole, I'm not talking the inverter, the panels, the, the, no, I'm talking about the general concept of what solar can do, not just the equipment, not just the installation, not just the financing, everything that happens to a customer when they get installed, right? We're gonna expand on that a bit more in a sec. Uh, elite solar sales guys are also focusing on their customers, how their customer's life will change after X. And again, I'm not saying after a solar installation, after a customer gets a good solar panel. X is everything that entails our product and what we're doing uh, with it. Uh, focuses on how, how X will also make their customer feel like in the future. Uh, that non-tangible feeling of what it's going to be like to take on X, right? Uh, and focus on what their customers will be able to do when they have X. The reason on why I'm not saying solar is because I want you guys to change your formatting again. We're going to jump into this in a minute here of what industry you're actually in, what product you're actually selling. If I were to say, you know, what the customer is going to feel like after they go solar, then it sort of limits your understanding of, okay, solar, solar tech, what does solar tech do? But instead, I want you to take a, a, a zoomed out version of what you're actually doing for people um, as we continue through this webinar, right? So let's start with an identification of what role everyone watching this thinks they have. This is something that so many people get wrong. And I hear it by like solar sales trainers as well. It's just flabbergasting. Okay, let's start from the top. Solar panel manufacturer. They are in the role and they are in the industry of photovoltaic technology and manufacturing. They are selling solar panels. I don't think anyone else in this entire industry is truly selling solar panels, except for manufacturers. They are literally selling solar panels, you know, racking, inverters, equipment to distributors, suppliers, warehousing, EPC. They are selling solar panels. Let's continue. Distributors. So often, um, uh, the way it works for those who have not been in the, the distribution or, or procurement side of things, we'll have a manufacturer, distributors will buy them in bulk, and then EPCs will buy them from distributors or warehouses um, uh, in bulk or single crates, right? Uh, distributors, in my opinion, are not selling solar panels. They're a distribution or, or a, a wholesale retail operation. EPCs, engineering, procurement, construction. So installers, i.e. Uh, the term that in the US use. I don't believe they're selling solar panels. They're contracting, they're construction. You know, everything that entails with construction. Meaning that uh, the, the reason why you see a lot of uh, uh, construction companies and in moving into solar, there's a ton of them out there that already have crews of doing some sort of home renovation, roofing. They now move into solar because they have the pre-existing infrastructure. Because they weren't selling, their job wasn't to sell solar panels before, it was construction, contracting. They had the infrastructure behind it. And finally, we get to dealers or whatever term you want to lose, S sales guys. 
us, teams, individuals, we're not selling solar panels. I've said this so often, our role is sales. Put it this way, if solar disappeared tomorrow, would you guys be out of a job? No. The skill set that you learn from selling solar panels is so directly transferable to so many other products. This goes to show that what we should be focusing on, what we're really learning here is not how to sell solar panels. It's sales, it's communication, it's value. It's being able to communicate value to people. And really being able to identify what your role is, what you should be focusing on is fundamental to you. So. Um, uh, when I operated a, a national EPC, our recruitment was wild. I would do group interviews at times of like 50 people twice a day to find door knockers back before we, we transitioned to virtual. And so I got a very large data set of people that would come through the door, uh, interacting with them for one to two minutes and then 10 minutes later and then seeing them in a group environment and then seeing them on their first day at work, uh, on the job and their first day door knocking or cold calling and then ultimately the amount of results, appointments and closes they would put through um, in that solar sales process. So I have a really large data set to understand who's going to be good and who's going to be bad. One of uh, my biggest red flags in recruiting that I eventually taught all of my recruiters um, and uh, recruitment managers is that if someone comes in and applies for a solar sales jo job, they're applying for a sales gig, but they list in their resume or they say in the interview that they went to school for photovoltaic technology or they were an engineer um, or they had something to do with the, the technology behind things. And they're using that, they're using that to bolster their credibility. Uh, that is a massive red flag because they clearly don't understand what they're getting involved in. They come with an engineering or saying, I studied renewable energy or I studied photovoltaic technology in university. I'm ready to jump into a you know, solar sales gig. It's just night and day that they have absolutely no idea what the job entails because this job has nothing to do with engineering, nothing to do with photovoltaic uh, technology on the fundamental level. They do not understand what they're getting involved in. And so we absolutely would not hire them because that we've just seen it so many times. They're engineers or people that thinking, understanding the technology, the tech, the equipment is gonna be the thing that's gonna get them deals. They come in, they flounder because they completely misunderstood the, the gig. They get no results, waste of time for both of us. So that was our one of our number one red flags, probably top three when people would submit resumes. We are not here to sell solar panels, to understand the technology, to understand the manufacturing, the distribution. I promise you people, again, already I know that a few of you out there are saying, oh, well, that's not 100% true. I'm going to challenge you like crazy tonight if you're already thinking that, okay? Us as sales guys focus on the value and the communication. If solar disappeared, we would be on to another product and we would thrive. Because if we're uh, identifying what we need to do in this gig, we've identified properly that anything has value. We just need to find the right thing to have value and sell it. That is what we're doing when it comes down to sales. All right, if sales was its own industry, that would be the industry uh, that we would be in. We are not in the solar panel industry if you're in sales. As soon as you start getting into the, you know, the, the fulfillment in the back end, then there's a bit more of an argument for it, but not when you're in sales. So. Uh, I want to cover two things. Number one is I want to cover what customers don't care about. A vast majority of care, uh, customers are not thinking or caring about or, or finding value in. And then number two, I'm going to do the opposite of what they actually care about. We're going to start uh, with, I, I've, I've done this, I've said this rule a lot, especially to VSC members in live training, but I've sort of coined it today. I came up with a, a term and the term I'm coming up with is the TMI rule. The TMI rule is really set. If you're asking yourself, what should I say and what shouldn't I say? What should I focus and what shouldn't I focus on? This is the rule that governs everything. So there's two parts to it. One is, uh, if a customer doesn't know about something and them not knowing about that won't change the product that you give them, then you don't need to put it in your pitch. And in fact, very often it's, it's negative to put it in your pitch. The opposite is also true. If the customer uh, discovering something ends up uh, making you change the product so they find something about it and say, oh, and they say something, and that whatever they say, their discovery of that one piece of information uh, causes you to change uh, the product that you were about to offer them, then that is something that you should say. However, I'll, I'll give some brief examples uh, in a sec here if that's a bit confusing. Um, however, I'm gonna back this up with, if you're not offering your product or your customer what they need from day one, 
and them convincing you to get them something else, that is not a matter of you not giving too much information. That's a matter of you bowing down to what a customer wants, not being a professional and not giving them what they need. Okay, I'll jump into to, to that in a sec, but let's just summarize that rule again. If something that you haven't said, so the discovery, if you did say it, the discovery of something, um, we'll get into some examples in a sec, do not change the product, the design that you are about to offer your customer, it is useless information, it is not necessary for the customer to know, and very often it is negative to actually put it in the pitch. Let's get into some examples so I, I can uh, clear away any confusion. Number one, this is like an obvious one that I still hear almost on a daily basis. The number of panels in your design is one of the most useless pieces of information you could possibly give your customer. Number one, and the number of panels is completely redundant. First off, the number of panels does not determine the amount of production. It is the total uh, uh, system size that does uh, and, and a few other factors. But number of panels has nothing to do with it. The same system size can have a greatly different number of panels based off the, the wattage of each panel. The number of panels is completely redundant. And yet I still hear people um, uh, telling their customers the number of panels. Re completely redundant information. Customers don't need to know this, and many times, customers will get confused by it. I don't know how many people out there have had a customer that's got uh, the number of panels and the total system size confused. I've had it dozens of times, right? Oh, uh, but you're giving me 30 panels, but Google said I only need 10. What do you mean? Oh, it says I need ten, a, ten, a size 10 system. Oh, no, it's a 10 kilowatt system. Wait, but you're giving me 30. Confusion, absolutely redundant information. Number two, a brand of panels. I guess ridiculous. If you're not, if you if you don't have faith in the brand that you're offering already, then why are you offering that brand? A little sneaky thing that everyone should know about in solar uh, brands. When it comes to to brands and panels, you can't unless you got some super sketchy uh, uh, link in the U.S. market. There's very few horrible brands out there. Of course, there's arguments. Oh, I don't want to use those. I've seen the breakdown. Uh, there's regulation, uh, especially in the U.S. market. If your installer or your UPC has a brand and it's like a well-known brand, it's probably a pretty decent tier one premium grade uh, panel. Okay. So by going to a customer and doing brands, we've done a whole training session on why to never mention brands to customers. It opens up such a can of worms, more confusion. And what does it do as well? A brief summary of our training from before. When you start uh, leaning on brand importance, you're putting energy into a brand as opposed to these non-tangible things that I'm about to get to in a sec. Um, thankfully, I feel like a lot of people have started to figure that out now, that mentioning brands is completely redundant and oftentimes very, very negative. But back when we didn't know any better, we would heavily lean on brands because we thought that that was gonna be the thing that, that got the deal done. And very often you'll find an unskilled solar salesperson, what they'll do is they'll start leaning on things other than sales ability to try to get the job done. So we're talking pricing, brands, warranties, all these things that, that they, it's not up to them to provide value, it's just numbers or letters on a, on a screen or on a, a piece of paper. Brands is certainly one of them. Um, and you know the question must be asked. Okay, but you know what if we say the brand and the customer says they don't want the brand, Josh? Like, wouldn't shouldn't it be truthful for us to you know shouldn't we be open and honest to say what brands we're using? My response is uh, twofold. Number one, you're going to let a customer who, if you're a solar sales professional, you should have far more understanding of what they need and what you have access to to get the job done properly than they do. If you start letting your customer push you around, and then it comes to brands and a few other things that we're about to get into, you are no longer a solar sales professional. You do not have their best intentions in mind. You only care about the sale. Very, very often, amateur solar sales guys, a customer will come back and say, oh, but I want this brand. I want this amount of panels. I want the system here. I want a battery, and start listing demands. And because the sales guy is just addicted to the sale, he wants to get the sale, he'll start bowing down to the customer instead of putting the authority down and saying, no, Mr. Customer, this is the best option. This is what we're gonna go for. Anything else is, is suboptimal. If you don't have the gonads to do that, number one, you're gonna lose sales because your authority is gone. And number two, you truly don't care about your customer. All you care about is a sale. And then, and, and thirdly, again, like I mentioned, um, if you already know your brand is super, super sketchy, 
So you almost feel you have a responsibility to mention it to a customer just in case they catch you and say, oh, that's not a good brand. But if they don't and you get the sale, well, at least you told them what brand you're using, then you're just a, you know, a piece of crap anyway because you're selling sketchy panels to begin with. Brand of panels is absolutely redundant when it comes to solar sales for a vast majority of customers. Let's keep going. This is where I'm gonna probably start uh, ruffling some feathers here. Focusing and spending time on intricate warranty details. Oh my God. Whether, here's a little quantum physics lesson for everyone out there. Whether a customer knows or doesn't know about your, uh, the details of your warranty is not going to change the details of your warranty when they get installed. It is not uh, beneficial to your sale to go into ultra detail about your warranty. It is not gonna change what warranty you have. And again, if you feel you have a responsibility to go into the details of the warranty, what that tells me is you have doubt in the warranty that you're offering to customers, and so you're giving them an opportunity to catch you out on some sketchy warranty details. If you have a solid warranty, and warranties are pretty damn solid in the US, 25 year to 30 year um, uh, efficiency uh, uh, production and guarantee pretty much standard, 10, 15 year workmanships, if all the way up to 20, 25 year workmanships, roof penetration warranties, production guarantees, like warranties are solid, pretty damn solid. It's, it's difficult, all panel manufacturers have like a minimum 25 year efficiency warranty. It's pretty difficult to find like a horrible warranty. Um, we got solar insure these days. A lot of people using external third party warranties, which I don't like, but some people use them. Warranties are pretty damn decent, okay? Uh, going into the intricate details is not gonna be number one, beneficial. Very often that conversation opens up cans of worms because customers don't understand how warranties work. Um, and you're creating a, a reality in which, I, I've mentioned this a lot, when you talk about warranties, in order to talk about warranties, you have to talk about the possibility that something bad is going to happen. Think about it. In order to really get into details, other than just a nice quick summary of your warranty and what it entails, to get into the details of warranty, you have to talk about what bad, what the bad things that could happen. So we have two options here. One is we go a nice quick summary of what the warranty is and move forward. No, there's no negatives involved here and the customer gets the warranty. Number two option is you start going into and if the roof is penetrated or if tiles get broken or if there's a leak or if your production like shuts off one day for some reason and you start going into all these things that I hear people say, number one, the product hasn't changed. The customer is still getting the same warranty but you're putting, you're putting energy in, into framing this information. Now you've created a negative reality in which any of this could happen. The warranty has not changed. The solar has not changed. But now the customer has a negative uh, uh, understanding, right? Not, a be not beneficial to the sale, not beneficial to the customer, and the product isn't getting any better just because you explain the warranty any differently, okay? Number two, or number four, I guess, panel design and layout. Oh my goodness. The US market, solar sales guys are addicted to design. It is crazy to see how many solar sales people think they actually have like the final say when it comes to design and how many people care so much about like the design software that they use. It's crazy. I'll give you another little uh, backend secret <laughs> for everyone. I, I'll, I'll, maybe I'll start with this. Uh, in Australia, when I, when I left the Australian market three years ago, three years ago, three and a half, uh, we didn't have solar system uh, design. We, we only just started using Pylon. I don't know if anyone else out there uses uh, Get Pylon. Uh, that's like an OG uh, solar system design tool. Uh, shout out, um, oh, what's the founder? Can't remember the founder's name, uh, but I used to speak with him a bit. Uh, that's what we use in Australia. We only just started using that. And what that was is our admin in the back end would just like throw some panels on to see if the panels fit. Here's the, the dirty little secret of the industry, US, Australia, industry-wide. Salespeople truly, really don't have that much say over the design. All that, all that matters is that salespeople get somewhat the orientation correct and that panels fit on the roof without going over the, the offsets, the fire offsets. What happens in the back end, just so everyone knows, when you submit a sale, the EPC, the installer, the engineers, first they'll go for site survey, 
Um, and they'll go to Aurora or they'll go to like some uh, high level CAD engineering platform, even if you used Aurora for the design initially, and they'll do a redesign almost every single time. Now, it's not substantial, right? Unless you, you horribly messed up the design, but generally there's a bit of movement involved and they're just making sure that everything's uh, sweet. When it comes to panel design and layout, you as a sales guy truly don't have that much input. And I truly believe uh, operating a national install uh, install company back in the day, a fully integrated EPC with installation, engineering, CAD, sales. Sales people should never design systems. Two reasons. One, they're not good at it. And two, they shouldn't be good at it. You should focus on getting the deal, some basic principles so you don't sell a system that has uh, a horrible design that's not going to fit. But at the end of the day, installers and engineers should be the ones that have the final say. So for example, in our platform in Cinevo, we have a front facing design tool and it's very, very simple. You put panels on, you make sure the rotation is good, they fit on the roof and they don't uh, um, uh, go over any uh, fire offsets, right? Over the corners of the, the property or of the roof or too close to the corners of the edges of the roof. And then it'll spit out a production. Uh, number and that production number maybe you move it like a foot over here a foot over here it, it changes by zero 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 one percent if you make those small adjustments right so the production is almost to the T uh, doesn't matter but the design is just very simply made it, you don't draw the whole things on the roof and get it down that's completely ridiculous so when it comes to design my friends this is one thing that I have a massive issue when it comes to people um, doing virtual sales over Zoom. Showing a customer the design. There's two issues we've just uh, uh, uncovered there. Number one, it might not be the final design. And you, as a sales guy, don't and probably shouldn't have any final say over that design, right? So when I say it might not be the final design, I'm not saying you know, the installer is gonna bloody move all the panels to the east facing roof, but there could be one array where I had a, a straight array of four panels, but now the installer thinks, no, we should just like cut that in half, and now two panels are just down here. Production barely changed, if at all, by 0.01%. Production does not change by any uh, uh, um, important metric whatsoever. But the look of the system does. Oh, now you told the customer the design, oh, but the design, we made the design perfect over here, and they've seen a, a full array um, happen over here and you, yep, that's exactly what's gonna happen. But now we've moved two panels over here. I don't know if you guys know what customer expectation is, but the second something changes and they weren't uh, uh, aware of it, so the installer redesigns and sends the, the design back for approval, they freak out. Here's another reason why focusing on the design is not a good thing. You show a customer a design and the customer comes back to you and says, I've heard this a million times. Oh, nah, nah, look, there's trees over there, there's shading over there. I, have you even factored that in? No, and what you gotta do is you gotta put it over there. And then they start designing the system for you. Amateur sales guys, what do they do? Oh, okay. Well, okay. So there's no trees over there. Uh, okay. What about what about this spot? And they start bowing down to the customer and redoing the design right there and then on the bloody sales process. Ridiculous. How how detrimental that is for you. Focusing on that design and as though that's going to be the thing that gets you the the sale. The customer is not actually saying, "Hey, I'm technically proficient at this. You got to do this." What they're saying is, "Hey, man." I just want to make sure that the system is going to produce enough power. Customers have no idea that you have shading analysis in your design tools. They have no idea that it pops out the production. They might think that you're just writing numbers on a page. So when they see a, a design and they say, oh, what about this? I think that there's more sunlight over here. They have no idea that's already pre-calculated. So there's two things that happen. Number one, if you focus on that design, that can happen, that whole can of worms. But number two, when that does happen, you then are almost are forced to go and, and, and change up the design, right? And now the customer is telling you how to design their solar system as if you're a customer service rep. So anyway, we're going off on a tangent. The proper response to that is saying, no, we've already done the calculations, John. This is the most optimal solution. As opposed to, again, redesign just because the customer says. But the customers don't care about the design. They just want to get the best optimized solution. That's really what they're caring about at the end of the day, okay? Let's keep going here. What else do customers not care about? Oh, no, what do customers care about? So a few things there that probably a lot of people still fit into their, their pitch, the brands, the equipment, the numbers, the, the warranty information, the number of panels, the system design, the technical, basically, at the end of the day stuff, the customers just don't care about. 
let's start focusing on what customers actually care about, what motivates them, what gets them to take action, what gets them to make an emotional decision right here, right now, let's go, this is it. Let's start with the numbers. This is an obvious one, so let's just get it out of the way. Numbers, but let's let's go deeper than savings, right? How many solar sales guys out there, they just stop at savings? Oh, you're gonna save so much money. What does it mean? What does saving money mean? Can you get a bit more? Are you stuck at a kindergarten level of explaining things or are you an adult and you can actually go a bit deeper? Let's go into it. What does saving money mean? Let's, talk, let's start with the stress, financial stress. Everyone, very simply, wants a smaller bill and a higher income. More money, more freedom. Less money, jail. I'm locked into things. I have a nine to five. I can barely make any more hours. I can't get a raise anymore and I'm barely scraping by. How do I get more freedom? How do I break free of this jail? Let's dive deeper, man. Past the, oh, it's gonna save you so much money. Oh, are you sure you don't wanna save some money? Mm, grade one, grade two, monkeys on the call. Get deeper. What does that mean for your customers? Another one, independence. This is my probably my favorite thing that very few people, solar sales guys out there do, but many elite sales guys out there like lean on this heavily. The independence that solar sales, uh, that solar gives to people. Nobody likes to rely on somebody. We wanna be self-sufficient, trusting billion dollar companies uh, to supply something necessary to live is a horrible, horrible situation to be in. I don't know if anyone's been on a call with a customer recently. Customers are not happy with their utility providers at all. But a ma vast majority of solar salespeople don't play on that. Maybe they'll throw it in uh, initially, but they won't lean on that non-tangible, powerful, powerful thing that makes customers, motivates customers to move and make decisions. This is important, guys. Now, you know, the savings are always gonna be there. The US market is set to be just one of the most craziest markets ever. I'm super excited about the next five to 10 years, but. This as well is an untapped value add that motivates people to do things. Here's the line, one of the lines, not my most uh, striking line for the night, but here's one line that usually gets people thinking. Solar absolutely does not need to save people money for it to be worthwhile and very worthwhile for them to go solar. Let me repeat that. People will buy solar and are very motivated on a daily basis in the US and globally to buy solar even when it does not save them a cent. I know a lot of you out there who really heavily rely on the savings and your entire perception of solar's values on the savings, that probably doesn't make sense to a lot of you. So think about it. The reason that that doesn't make sense to you, that solar, oh, well, solar has to save people money for it to make sense is because you have been brought up or have entered into the industry and have only seen that value proposition and have been taught that that is the number one value proposition and therefore your understanding of solar's value and therefore your customers, because that's how you're framing it, is that it has to save them money. My friends, this is simply not the case. Simply not the case. There are, there are several states in the US that I know and, and many solar pros out there that I know selling in states right now in which solar is a, is a, a, a bill match for years. There is no savings, definitely not day one savings, maybe 15, 20, 25 years. The reason people got buy solar at a very high volume, a very high level in those cases is to get off the utility company, to become independent, to get all these non-tangible value propositions that solar has. The only reason though it's able to be sold that way is because the solar sales guy on the other end understands that the value proposition of solar is not just the standard savings thing that we hear 24 seven. Let's go in again, consistency. Man, is this ever a big one. You go to a customer and say, hey man, you're not gonna save any money. It's gonna be the same uh, as it is right now. The most important thing though, it's not gonna go up it's not gonna go up or down. You're gonna know exactly what's coming out of the account. It's gonna help you budget. You're literally getting the same thing you're getting now, except that number that's coming out of your account for your power is not constantly going up and down. You know what's coming up, you can plan for it, you can budget for it, uh, and you're aware of what, what your uh, uh, energy expenditure looks like. That is massive value. In fact, people will pay extra for that. The benefits of, be, uh, of being able to know the annoyance of constantly having a bill that's up and down and 
One day it's double and you're like, what the hell is going on? And you don't know how much money's coming out of the account. You have ACH auto debit a set up with a utility. You have no other options. You have one person taking a random amount of money and seemingly increasingly random amount of money every single month. How on God's green earth are you going to budget for that? How are you going to raise a family not knowing what the hell the utility company is taking out of your pocket? The consistency alone is worthwhile spending a few extra bucks every month. These are non-tangible, non-savings, but non-tangible, non-technology equipment based value that customers yearn for. Throwing this into your pitch and in fact leaning on things like this is very, very powerful. Let's keep going. Progression. Okay, now we're starting to get a bit deep. Everybody wants to progress. Everyone wants an opportunity to take back a bit more control over their life, to move forward. The young couple that got married and had a kid or two in their early 20s wasn't planning on being in the same financial spot in their 30s that they were in their 20s. Yet here they are. Why? This is a rat race, man. And it's difficult to get out. A vast majority of your customers probably feel the same way. Maybe they feel a little progression here and there. Maybe they've had some raises, maybe they've had some slight career opportunity uh, and progression, but it's never as much as your customers thought it would be. Everyone in their 20s, they're driving, they're motivated. They see their future 30 years, when they're 40 years old, when they're 50 years old, they see it so much more differently. They thought they were gonna be so much more further than they are. I promise you, a vast majority of people are disappointed with the progress they have made. Solar can be a massive step in progression. They finally have an opportunity to get a bit further, to get a, get a bit more control over their life, to get off the utility company, the, these guys that have just been getting hit four or $500 bills, and now their budget is, you know, they had that money in the account and all of a sudden a massive bill comes and they, they thought they were saving up a bit, but then the utility bill doubles. Solar could be that one piece for them to make that step, to make that progress, to be that one thing, that opportunity they take advantage of to keep going. That feeling of making moves, right, to better yourself is an amazing feeling. Upgrading, right, I wanna upgrade my life. I, that's why people get um, uh, bloody home renovations done, right? They wanna upgrade their kitchen, why? The practical purpose is not really, they get a new fridge. The old fridge worked. It's because they wanna upgrade, they wanna progress. Why do people always get the new iPhone? Do they really need that extra two megapixels? Do they really need that extra uh, feature about how Siri can make your... No, they just want, they want to progress. They want to feel current. They don't want to lose any opportunity. That's human psychology. That's human nature. And solar is certainly a massive factor. They've been on the utility company for years and years and years and years. They didn't think they had any other opportunity to, to progress in that realm. They, they took that, that constant increasing power bill as just, that's what it is. We can't do anything else. But now solar comes along and offers a solution to just get a slight upper edge on that. That's all they need. Life hasn't given them any upper hands, any upper edges. They'll take what they can get. Play on that. Because it's true. It's legitimate. We're not selling pixie dust here. Solar actually has that ability to, to help people out in that regard. And the control aspect as well. When they have no control of where their power is going and all of a sudden you come in with a solution where they have just a bit more control. They have that power station on their roof. They know how it is. They can see the panels. They can see the wires. It's in their house. They have more control over it. Man, does that feel good. The utility companies have made an absolute monopoly of an industry, uh, giving people what they absolutely need to survive with absolutely no option of what they can pay for it. It is insane, the energy industry. My God, is that it's such an amazing business model. Speaking purely business, that is superb. That is brilliant. No wonder uh, uh, more millionaires and billionaires are made in energy and oil than any other uh, in, uh, industry. Phenomenal. Hats off to whoever came up with that business model. Here's the thing. Solar's about to fucking kill it. It's about to kill it. Because solar now decentralizes that. Solar now puts that power into the hands of the individual. Gives them a lot more control of where their power is coming from. Literally, they can see the power station on the roof. 
They don't have to trust some random build that said they got a delivery charge for a bloody power station that's five miles up the road and apparently they're doing work on a new uh, coal plant or, uh, you know, putting the power lines underground and that's why I have an extra $100 a month. Oh, I have to trust this power bill that tells me I'm paying for the utility company to do upgrades on their own infrastructure. They can't pay for it. No, I have to pay for it. That's fine. Game over. Solar on the roof. There's the lines going in. My lights are on. Done. Wow. Talk about the, the aspect of control there. Nothing to do with the understanding the tech. Just give them a bit more control, man. Peace of mind. I mean, I don't have to expand on that, right? Put all these factors together. The peace of mind that, that uh, uh, solar can offer your customers is phenomenal. Now keep in mind, these, this value is here. But many customers that have solar and will go solar in the coming years will never really truly feel the, the depth of this. Why? Because the sales guy is shit at explaining the value to this. Two sales guys sell the exact same system. One sells the brands, just the panels, right? Two, yeah, okay, covers the panels, but covers everything else. The customer, although they're getting the damn identical, physically the, the, the identical system, that second guy comes in and shows them all this other value, the customer doesn't feel they're getting the same product. No way. They feel they're getting a far, far more superior product because the value, the true value behind solar has actually been explained to them clear as day right in front of them. You wanna know how to differentiate? This is how. Because 99% of people in solar sales right now and who will move into solar are not skilled enough or are far too lazy to ever to jump into to real things that people really care about right here. That's truly how you differentiate. Um, a few other things, not missing out, obviously uh, a, a fear of loss, um, massive, massive factor. Everyone wants to find again that, that, that one thing, that opportunity uh, that's there right now, that, that fleeting moment that they can grab, that can take advantage of and upgrade their life a bit more. But in summary, to put this all together, what do customers care about? It's what X, again, can do for your customer. In this case, X just happens to be solar. And to hammer this point home, I don't know if anyone remembers my old analogy with the potato. I actually haven't told this for a long time. Uh, if you notice in the, in the, the VSC HQ, uh, right behind my desk, I actually have a potato. For those of you who have not heard this analogy before, I truly don't think we're in the solar panel industry to the extent that if I could show a customer that I could grab a potato and tape it to their bloody roof and that could save them $50,000, $100,000 over the next decade or two, I and everyone here, we'd be selling potatoes. It just so happens though, the thing that does that, that benefit, all that benefit that that potato could possibly bring to the customers, the thing that does it right now who knows what's gonna happen in the future? It certainly wasn't the, the product that did this in the past. There were other products that did this in the past. What's doing it right now, all those benefits that we're going over just happens to be this weird amalgamation of glass and, and, and metal and brackets and, and cables. And we just happen to call it solar. That is a coincidence. The placeholder right now is solar. Who knows what it's gonna be in the future? And it certainly wasn't that in the past. We have a placeholder and it's providing value that, that uh, uh, people are motivated by. But we have to identify that if the magic potato comes out in the future, I'm damn well sure sell, uh, selling potatoes because that's the thing that's gonna benefit my customer the way it is. But right now, it's solar. So when we take a look at benefits, we take a look at whatever our product is, X everything, not just the equipment, but everything that it entails. And we ask ourselves, what can this do for my customer? And when you ask that question, the thought process of having to understand the de technical details and the equipment and the brands and how a photovoltaic energy works and the details of the warranties, that just becomes redundant. Because a solar panel can't do anything for a customer. Cabling, an inverter, a, a warranty, piece, you know, some, something on a piece of paper can't do anything for them. Truly, at the end of the day, it does nothing for them. But the combination of all of that all of that together in one nice little X, one nice little product, not just the physical, but the non-tangible do wonders 
but you have to identify that it's further, it's deeper than just cool warranties or cool little technology or savings. You have to identify everything that's behind that and get a bit deeper with your customer and identify what they truly care about. Because if they saw that the potato could do all that for them, they'd have potatoes on the roof. It just so happens that it's this weird solar panel thing coming out right now. So let's do some uh, challenging takeaways here. I got five points. Number one, the first thing I want everyone to ask yourself right now and after this ends is, what is your product and who is your customer? And hint, hint, hint. Your product is not solar, you're not selling solar panels. Manufacturers sell solar panels to distributors or EPCs. You are not a manufacturer. Who, what is your product? Who is your customer? And, and you know, if you need one step further, write a list of things of what your product is and don't put solar panels on that list. See what you come up with, right? You're not a panel manufacturer. You're not an installer selling workmanship. You're not a finance provider selling finance terms. What does your customer actually care about? Because they don't give a rat's ass about solar panels. I can almost guarantee you that. For probably a majority of customers you will ever interact with, they truly could not give a rat's ass about solar panels. Number two, simplify your pitch. So probably a majority of people watching this right now, even uh, uh, people that have uh, been in the game for a while, people that are just jumping in, you probably have this massive pitch. And I know because I've written a million pitches and I've reviewed a million pitches, I know when you first start out that you start learning more about solar, technical information, cool little facts, and your, your little brain goes, oh, wouldn't that be cool if I told my customer that? Oh, cool. And you start throwing in everything, right? One of, the, one of the biggest indications to me that like graphic designers or marketers running ads or people writing pitches are brand new is because they have everything they could possibly think of in their pitch because they're worried that if they don't say that, it's gonna have less benefit. But then you end up with the classic features versus benefits and just start listing these crazy amount of features and benefits. Everyone at VSC um, that's been in my training knows how damn simple things can be. Uh, so for example, to challenge everyone else out that doesn't know that, in our training, in our close, we mentioned four numbers. That is it. Four numbers. And then the close happens. Simplify your pitch and apply the TMI rule. So go through your pitch tonight and just read everything that you're telling your customer and apply it. So read something. If, you're, if you wonder whether you should say it or not, say it, apply the rule. Ask yourself, if I didn't say this line, would my product change? Okay, so here I'm mentioning how um, install is going to happen in uh, 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 10 days after this and permitting happens over here. Okay, so if I didn't mention this, would install take longer? No. Would it take shorter? No. Okay, cool. I won't mention it unless the customer asks. Sweet. Okay, here I'm mentioning panel brands and that my the panels are 375 watts. Okay, well if I didn't mention this, would the panels be 400 watts? I wish. No. Would they be 350? No, okay. Well, my product wouldn't change. I'll just take it out. If the customer asks, I'll let them know. That's what the simplification process is gonna look like. What that's gonna do is it's really gonna help you narrow in on what you should be focusing in on and what you shouldn't be focusing in on, okay? Um, are you listing features instead of benefits? Are you throwing out meaningless facts and numbers that the customer has truly no idea about? Probably, probably. I, I trim the fat on pretty much every single call I, I review on a daily basis in live training at VSC. Number three, do you think your customer actually, uh, customers actually like solar? I mean, I, I don't think there's anyone out there that thinks this, but if there is people out there that think, yeah, you know what, I, my customers really care about solar and if I just give a really good explanation of how solar works, you know, I think that's what's gonna close deals. I'm gonna challenge you, you know, number five here. But man, if you think that at this point, you guys have a reality check at the end of the day, I believe. Um, what does solar mean for your customer? Do you think they will be more impressed with the technology or what the technology does for them? Are you pitching uh, engineers and scientists 24-7? Uh, or are you pitching regular people with regular problems, with a regular understanding of life and what solar does? Number four. Are you assuming an understanding of value? So I mentioned earlier uh, this this concept and I see it a lot 
Um, and it plays into this theme, this topic, because we're talking about value, right? We're talking about what makes people buy. And uh, I, I still don't have a, a better term for it. I've always coined it a psychopathic sales. Psychopathic sales is when you learn about your product and you didn't know anything about it before. And then all of a sudden, in your pitch, you're assuming that the customer has the same amount of product knowledge as you do from day one, just because you know about it. You're unable to get outside of your head. You're psychopathic. You're all in your head. Reality revolves around you. So I see this so much. It's similar to when, um, let's say a friend of yours started a new job, right? And there's some new work jargon, you know? So let's say they start at Starbucks. Probably they're the worst, right? They had knew nothing about Starbucks before. And, um, uh, and, and then they, they learn the terms, right? Uh, oh, you know, I had to, I, I'm not a coffee guy or anything. I'm going to make up some terms. It's, for me, it sounds like Starbucks. I had to, to, to flip the, uh, the, the bean presser uh, and I put in a, you know, a 2022 20, gauge in there. And yeah, it was crazy. You know, you, yeah, you understand what I mean, right? People start a new job and then they learn all these terms in a week or two and then they start selling it to you. And you're like, dude, I have no idea what you're talking about. Why would I know what you're talking about right now? Right. I had a, a friend and she was uh, studying in, in medicine and she did the same thing. I, I'm not a doctor. She'd start throwing out these terms. Oh, yeah. No, I had this constant, you know, this uh, this uh, patient and he had this, uh, you know, he had gastroendronisis cystis. It was crazy. You know, he was taking I'm like, dude, I don't know what you're talking about. Instead of using those terms, tell. So we do this in sales a lot. When you assume the customer already knows about solar. So you hear solar and you're like, you learn about solar, oh, solar saves you money. Okay, well, customers must already know this. It very often will change your pitch, change your framing, because you go straight into something like no out-of-pocket cost, right? Or let's say you're cold calling. I hear this a ton. You're cold calling and you say something about solar. Customer says, oh, solar, no, no, I'm not interested. And then immediately you go into, no, 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 wait, are you sure? It's no out-of-pocket cost. We don't need anything from you. Why would the customer give a rat's ass if it's no out-of-pocket cost if they just don't see the value and benefit in solar? That's what you need to attack, not the no out-of-pocket cost. Are you sure we're using the bigger panels now? Who the fuck cares what panels you're using? Customers don't know how solar works. Explain the benefits to them. So don't understand absolutely any value to solar. Start from day one. Build the infrastructure of value with your customers. Don't assume they think anything about solar, especially when it comes to value or savings. Um, uh, are you assuming that when a customer hears solar, they think benefits? Probably not. In fact, probably the opposite these days. Are you finding yourself trying to convince customers that your solar is high quality? Are you? If you're in a pitch and a close and you find that you're in a time where you're constantly trying to convince them that your technology is good or that your panels are really good or it's black on black, it's high wattage, high production. If you are, you're focusing on the wrong things because a customer, probably a vast majority of customers are listening to you and thinking, dude, I don't care. You're obviously trying to sell me. What is it going to do to my life? What are the benefits for me and my children? That's what they're really thinking. Okay. That's what they're really thinking here. Um, and if someone is on the street, throw a little thought experiment, and they try to sell you a uh, uh, call it. They come up to you and say, man, I got the best call it ever. The reason why it's so good is because there's a spring here, and what it does, and you're like, dude, I don't know what that is. You know, you're explaining to me how cool your product is, but what does it do for me? No thanks, and you just keep walking. That's what you're doing in solar, right? When you when you start selling your call it's and customers have no idea what you're talking about. Focus on what actually benefits them. Stop talking about the features. And the last, uh, probably most challenging thing I'm gonna say tonight is focus on the emotional sell and the last one in a sec here. Solar is not a technical sale. Although I've heard a million solar sales trainers unfortunately say that the thing that's gonna get you the most deals is your technical understanding. I'm sorry, but they've just never sold solar at a high level. They have no idea what they're talking about. You're not a solar technician. Your customer could not give a rat's ass about how solar works a vast majority of the time. Your customer cares about how will it affect their life. 99% of customers don't care how the technology works. They just want to have the benefit to their life. Your technical understanding, your technical understanding will not be the make or break to your results. And here's my final challenge to, to you guys out there just to hammer this home. The best, and I mean the 
best 80 90 percent solar closers out there the best solar people in the world know the least about how solar works how the technology works about how their product works and i know this is so counter to the whole know your product and you'll get sales product knowledge product knowledge i'm not i'm not speaking from learning sales books or seeing some sales guru i'm seeing from 10 years in solar myself having extremely high close rates historical 76 percent close rate historically for 10 years seeing the elites at 70 80 90 percent it was stereotypical from the environment that i grew up in it is known publicly it was obvious that the best solar sales guys out there did not know how solar worked or the technology worked or anything about the problem i knew barely anything uh, to the point that I had sold hundreds of deals and I didn't know anything how solar worked. Anything. The reason is, is because those guys focus on sales and communication and closing. Now the question that everyone has to ask now is, but Josh, isn't that detrimental to the customer? They don't know their product. They don't know all this. They could be designing things wrong. They, you know, they could be. Here's the magical thing about solar. Solar sales guys don't need to know that. Design teams, engineering, take care of the final design. As long as you're not working with a sketchy engineering team or installer, they're gonna make sure that no sketchy installs happen. Uh, product manufacturers and EPCs make sure the product that, that's being sold is good and the warranties are there. It's not your job to get a better product, uh, equipment, panels, inverter. It's not your job to get a better warranty. It's not your job to design the system. It's not your job to do all this stuff. So as long as you're following the basic fundamental rules, designing the, the size of the system as good for their production, as long as you're following the basic rules, which can be learned in an hour, you can just focus on sales, man. Now, am I saying that if you learn technical stuff, it's gonna be detrimental to your sales? Yes and no. Many people, if they start learning technical stuff, they throw it in, it's too much information for the customer. So in that way, yes. But if you're an OG and you know what too much information looks like, uh, but you just use some basic technical information in the off chance that you have a conversation, you know, to you know motivate your customers to teach them more about solar, it could very well be beneficial. But it's not going to be the thing that gets you closing at 50, 60, 70 percent. No way in God's green earth is it going to be the thing. It's not your solution. Solar knowledge, technical knowledge, is not your solution for closing at a high level. It's everything we just talked about. It's understanding customer psychology. It's basic sales principles. It's understanding the difference of, of benefits and features. The technical information, that can come later. That can be the cherry on top of the cake. But I promise you, that is not the solution for you closing at a high level. The best solar salespeople in the world, to this day, generally know the least about the technical information about solar. You know why? Because they're not selling solar panels. They're selling everything solar panels do for their customers. That is what sells. The reason they're the best is because they learned how to sell freedom. They learned how to sell a little control over the customer's lives, a little independence, give the customer a little independence. They learned how to sell, sell peace of mind. Solar panels are just the channel that they're selling that through right now. Give it 10 years, it might be potatoes. Food for thought, food for thought. But that's why I believe customers really buy solar and how elite sales guys actually sell solar. I hope you learned something. Awesome. So that will conclude the little challenge of the night a little mind, uh, mindset swap of the night. Whether you learned something um, or whether you thought you knew everything that I went over today, go through your script, review your calls, and ask yourself, are you focusing on the right thing? Is what you're saying what customers actually care about? Or do we need to do a little, little change in our framing? Change in our mindset and therefore the framing in the customer's mindset. Be, be objective to yourself. Let the ego go and see if you need to make some changes. Cool. Awesome. Well, I hope you guys learned something. 
Uh, hit your scripts tonight. Let me know if you, uh, you learned something. VSC members, I'll see you in training uh, tomorrow. Let me know what you thought. Um, and for everyone else out there, I do hope you grab value. What we're going to do now is uh, we're going to wrap this up. We're going to head back to uh, the desk. I'm going to give uh, a bit more details, and then we're going to wrap up the night, and uh, I'll send you guys on your merry way. Cool? I'll see you guys back at the desk, and uh, we shall wrap up tonight. See you back there.